So this evening, we'll get to hear from our librarian uh, Lim Tin Seng, who give us a glimpse of his research on the greening of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lim Tin Seng. Thank you everyone for attending this talk. Yeah, appreciate it very much. I uh, hope I can use this as a good platform to have a discussion on my current research. Now, speaking of research, okay, doing research to create content is probably what I do here. And uh, it's, it's a pretty challenging job, but uh, re rewarding at the same time because I get to work on many topics of related to Singapore history. So some, over the years, some of the topics that I dealt with include the development of the Central bus Business District, the Golden Shoe, also the history of urban planning, as well as Singapore's changing coastline due to land reclamation. But today I won't, won't be ta talking about this, I'll be talking about the green of Singapore. And to be more specific, to trace Singapore's green journey from the colonial period to the present. So with such, such a coverage, I think it's pretty logical to break it down into two smaller questions. Not rocket science questions, but uh, very easy. So how was uh, the greening of Singapore carried out during the colonial period? And how did the government turn Singapore into a garden, ci garden city? So let's jump into the first question, colonial greening. Okay, many of us have this impression that the greening of Singapore began 1967 after we launched the Garden City vision. But if you have the chance to look at some of our historical sources from the archives as well as the library, you do find this, you, you do find this link that uh, the greening actually started back in the colonial period. Well, but if you compare the, co co the colonial, colonial greening to today's greening strategy, it's, it's very different because there wasn't an overall policy, okay, a directive like a garden city. But nonetheless, there were greening activities. In fact, we can actually break it down into these following areas. Creation of, of the botanic gardens, the establishment of nature reserves, tree planting, and the creation of recreation spaces. Okay, when you talk about the public gardens, I think the first thing to know is that what we have today in Tangling is not the first botanic garden, right? The first one was actually conceived back in 1822. Okay, even, even before then, there was a spice garden in Fort Canning Hill that was started by Breakfast. And the purpose of the, that garden in Fort Canning Hill was to experiment the cultivation of commercial crops. So we are talking things like um, coffee, tea, cacao, uh, cotton, and of course, nutmeg and cloves. All right, but this 1822 garden, it was, con it, it was actually put forward by Nathaniel Wallich. So Nathaniel Wallich, he was the superintendent of the bot botanic garden in Calcutta. Now, in September 1822, he actually made a stopover in Singapore, and he was very impressed by the rich bio di biodiversity that he came across on the island. Then he felt the next step for Singapore was to establish a, bot a, bot a botanic garden. So the purpose of that garden was to build up this botanical collection of native plants. That's native to Singapore, as well as to cultivate commercial crops. So when he put forward this idea to Raffles, all right, Raffles was pretty Aesthetic, all right. He was, uh, he, he he agreed. Okay, he said that we should sell this garden, and to show his support, he actually gave one thousand dollars from his own money, from his own pocket, to fund the project. He also allocated a, quite a huge piece of land, a nineteen hectare land that stretches that stretch from the northeastern slopes of Fort Canning all the way to today's Mount Sophia. When he communicated with, with uh, Wallach, he called that garden a superstructure. It's a pretty modern term, but you can see it. He called it a superstructure. And he has this grand vision of turning the garden as well, as well as the whole of Fort Canning Hill into a very pretty garden. I, I mean, a, idiot, a very, very pretty park, sorry. Okay, and uh, he also had this grand vision of putting an enclosure with 200 spotted deer. deer. Unfortunately, he realized that yeah, it's a bit impractical because it's just too expensive to fund such a project. 
So he scaled it down. But nonetheless, construction started quite promptly. In January 1823, he had the residents staying in that area evicted. And by February, the garden had its southern walls, southern fence, as well as some pathways and roads. Well, but things did not went as smoothly as Raffles had hoped because uh, Wallach was unable to secure a return to Singapore. In fact, Wallach wanted to be the super, first superintendent of that garden, but he was un unable to do so, nor was he able to send someone who was, who was qualified to take that post. So, we, so Raffles had no choice but to appoint Dr. William Montgomery. Now, for he, he was a surgeon by training, all right, and he actually intended to Raffles and his, and his headaches, and William Farquhar when he was there. Anyway, he was a surgeon by training, and given the fact that he was only equipped with 11 laborers and three convicts, he was able to build up the garden pretty well, because in five years' time, the garden had a fence around it, as well as uh, more roads and pathways. Now, he also constructed some terraces on the, on the slopes of Fort Canning to prevent so soil erosion, and he set up this plantation with 600 nutmeg and 300 clove trees. So pretty impressive. But unfortunately, in 1823, I mean, sorry, 1828, he was posted to India, and within a year, the garden was no more. Due to budget constraint, the government had to, had to shut it down. The land was then passed out for various projects, including the Armen Armenian church in Hill Street today, as well as the first Roman Catholic church. That one uh, is where the National Arts Museum sits today. But one thing to note is that not the entire garden was taken down. In fact, a little, small little portion was, was, uh, was kept, and it, con it, com it consisted of about 200 nutmeg trees. And that site actually formed the site of our second bot botanic gardens. Now, this second botanic gardens was set up in 1836 by the Agricultural and Horticulture Society. Now, what is this society, right? Okay, they actually have a very interesting way of defining themselves. Okay, they say that this society was actually formed by almost all the European gentlemen on the island. Well, guess who is in the ranks? Montgomery, he actually returned as, uh, in 1834 as senior surgeon. And together with his assistant, Thomas Oxley, yeah, they were the part of this society. Now, this society had this vision, okay, this large garden vision. It's nothing like our garden city vision. It's not about planting trees. It's not about building parks. It's actually sim more closely resemble that picture down there. It's, a, it's a, actually an earth scorching policy. They wanted to clear the whole island of its primary forest and replace it with plantations. And how do how do they how are they supposed to do it, right? The way is to um, diversify the the crops that were being planted. So instead of nutmeg, you know, the usual nutmeg and cloves, there'll be more. There'll be like vegetables and there will be fruits and there'll be coconuts. And the garden, the purpose of that garden, second garden, was to showcase to prospective planters what could be planted on the island. Yeah, that's the purpose. And also to work towards that goal, they actually persuaded, I mean, they actually kind of, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether they play a role in it, but they did, they did state that the government should actually uh, relax the restricti restrictive land ownership law to stretch beyond the 20-year 20, 20 mark. So that happened in 1843, right? Yeah, 1843. So what happened is that the government decided, okay, fine, all right, we can actually sell land in per perpetuity. In 1843, the government said, okay, we can sell the land in perpetuity for agricultural purposes, okay? And what happened is that it actually, it actually led to this drastic change to our landscape, all right? So, what, what I show up there is this 1846 survey map of Singapore prepared by John Turnbull Thompson. All right, this is one of the most accurate survey maps at the time. And you can see the plantations around town. So we have our fruit plantations, nutmeg plantations, coconut plantations, and all this. 
All right, so, but by this time, this map was drawn out. The garden was no more. That's because, why? Probably because the society's members, they, they themselves, were too, were too into their own planting ambition, all right? In fact, Thomas Oxley, he had this 70 hectare, 17 hectare Namek plantation in Clinney. In fact, uh, Oxley Rice was named after him. As for Montgomery himself, he also had another pl Namek plantation. His plantation a bit, was a bit smaller, around roughly about seven hectare, and uh, and it was uh, located in Ryan's Hill. Now that is in Bukit Basso Road today. Now one thing to note is that you just think about the size of their of their Namek plantations. They are already bigger than than the second Botanic Gardens. The second Botanic Gardens was roughly about three hectare. So perhaps they lost interest, and by 1846, it was recorded as no more. So with that, we can move on to today's garden. That's the Tanning Garden, all right? Just, I think uh, everyone should know how it was est established, right? Especially after the garden was, uh, was received its uh, UNESCO status, right? Anyway, just to recap, it was established 1859, and it was uh, by this Agri Horticulture Society, Singapore Agri Horticulture Society. In fact, that we have one of their annual reports. It's dated 1866. I put it over there in the display. There was an individual in there that was very uh, that was responsible for acquiring the land, the train, the land today, and that's one pole. All right. The purpose of that garden was a bit different from what we have seen so far. Okay, it was to be a landscape ornamental garden, a leisure park as well as to study horticulture and botany. And to design this, they actually hired Lawrence Neven. Lawrence Neven was a gardener at the nearby plantation. He's, he was a Scotman, and he came from a family of gardeners. And how he designed this garden was based on this English landscape movement. So what is this, all right? So this English landscape school movement, just think of it as antithesis of the former gardens that you see in continental Europe, Europe at that time. So something like uh, the gardens of Versailles, right? So you can see over there, the garden of Versailles is so you know, symmetrically, symmetrically, precisely, and carefully manicured. Everything is so precise. But the English garden, on the other hand, is about being in harmony with the natural environment. So we are talking things like rolling landscape, curving roads and paths, plantings at different heights with a mix of trees and shrubs. And this map actually shows all these elements in our potent gardens. And in fact, today, if you go there, you, know, you can actually see it very clearly. And these are some pictures out there. Up there, yeah, you can see all these elements. But it did not. It, did, it, it was not cheap to 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 to, de, to craft up this garden because Neven actually spent almost bankrupted the society in two years. He spent one thousand four hundred dollars out of one thousand nine hundred dollars of the society's capital. And the society themselves, okay, since it's a private society, right? They have to run the garden, so they had to generate revenue. They had to, to in order to maintain the garden. So what they did is, they did not make it into. A, a public park, all right. It's a it's a subscription-based park, and everything that they that that they held flower shows, concerts, you know, when they invited the military military bands to play in the bandstand, as well as fireworks display. All this had to be paid, one to two dollars back then. So it's not cheap, right? And if you want to if you want to use the garden, if you want to take their flowers, take their seeds. Well, you have to join the society as a member. That's $25. And on top of that, you have to pay a monthly fee of $1. So, not cheap. Okay? But despite charging that, they still, well, end up with debt and financial problems, and they have problems running the garden. So, in the end, the government has to build it out. In 1874, the government built them out. Actually, not really built them up. They actually took over the garden. And that is actually a blessing in disguise because from then on, they started to hire all these trained horticulturists and botanists. And they, what they did is they helped advance the bot botany and horticulture discipline in Singapore as well as the garden. They publish a lot, they label the plants, they do all these things today that we still see today. 
They also introduced uh, plants with high commercial values, like rubber and orchid breeding, I mean orchid, orchid hybrid. And also, they played a very important role okay, in our greening, greening agenda, greening in, in initiatives during the colonial period. For example, these two, they are the superintendents, all right? And then uh, we, we know who, who the one down there is, right? Henry, Henry Ridley. The one up there is Nathaniel Kenley. Nathaniel Kenley. So they are the superintendent and later directors. For Ridley, he later became the director of uh, Botanic Gardens. And what they did is, one of the first things they did is they sell our nature reserves. So we move on to the next area. Now we talk about nature reserves. Why did it come about, right? Okay, we, the nature it is actually linked to the deforestation of the island. And this problem, if, as we have seen earlier, right? You see that after they relax the land ownership law, there was a proliferation of plantations. And it actually continues. Continues uh, and the plantation actually changed, okay? That's because nutmeg was actually wiped out in the 1850s, but it was replaced by gambia and pepper. And the gambia and pepper plantations grew from about 20 plantations all the way to 600 from 1819 to 1848. And that reduced the forest cover from 82% to 60%. So by the 70s, 1870s, only 10% were left. To, to give you an idea of how terrible it was, right? We have this map. This is an 18, 1852 survey map of Singapore. I have it there. Later, you can take a look. There's this line right in the middle that says the whole of the interior is covered by pepper and gambia plantations intermixed with primeva forest. So you can see the extent of this deforestation problem back then. So this deforestation problem actually caused a lot of environment, environmental problem, and they were actually recorded. One would be soil erosion after heavy rainfall. In fact, after that, after the heavy rainfall, the soil erosion will actually cause the rivers to run muddy, and it was recorded. Another one would be climate change. In fact, it was also recorded that back then, there was a reduction in the rainfall. All right? And this reduction in rainfall is actually causing problems to the municipality because they actually rely on rainwater, rainwater to clear the drains. Another problem would be, of course, it kind of damage the ecosystem, and this lead to extinction of a lot of native and na na native plants and animals. But one thing I note, one thing I have to note is that when the when the government finally took action in, in the 1870s, they did not take action because of these environmental problems. All right, they took action because they were worried about the diminishing supply of timber. Because without the forest, there's less, there, there won't be any timber left. And timber was very important back then. It was used for construction, it was used for furniture making. So well, in the end, they still take action. And they commissioned colonial engineer John McNear to do a study on the forest to find out the availability of timber resources. Well, well in his study, he, in his survey, yes, he found out that, okay, yes, we are, we are losing our forest, and that was because of the plantations. And we had to do something about it. We had to set out nature reserves. We had needed a department to take care of these nature reserves. And that job was given to Nathaniel Kennedy in 1881. All right? He took over, and then he did his own survey in 1883, and because he was sick, you know, but then he came back. He, he finished his uh, survey in 1882. He was, then he published it. I mean, he reported it to the Legislative Council. Again, I have the, the report is over there in the rare case, I mean, in, in, in that jewel case. So what you can get from this report is the same narrative, all right? We need reserves. We need a map that draws out, that demarcate where the reserves are. And we need, we need a, for, a, a department, a forest department to take care of it. We need legislation to protect them. OK, so. With that, uh, Kennedy actually started, started identifying where the reserves were. In his report, there is this map that shows where the reserves might be. But in the end, he was able to expand it, all right? And he was able to identify 14 reserves. 
1886. And you can see they are all over the place. You know, we have 14 reserves. We don't, today we only have four. So, okay, that's pretty good, right? One thing you have to note is that the water catchment area was not included because it was owned by a French planter called Leopold Chasserieu. All right. His plantation was the largest at the time, 485 hectares, and it also consisted the water catchment, all right? the municipal reservoir, the impound reservoir, they actually call it back then. And because of that, this part of the forest was preserved, was conserved, because part of the deal in, in acquiring this huge piece of land was he was not supposed to touch the, the area around the water catchment. Hence, that was being conserved for some reason, right? And so anyway, when they drew out all this forest, forest reserve, one thing you have to know is that they, are, they were not fully covered with primary forest. In fact, most of them were actually wheat-covered wasteland. And that was because back then, all these areas have already been cleared from plantations, all right? And from and then they were left abandoned and was now covered with weeds. So for, because of that, they actually spent a lot of their time during, their form, during the forest department's formative years to reforest these areas. So what they did is that they set up nurseries to do so. They have uh, a big force, a workforce, about 600 laborers and 20 watchmen. But of course, you know, one thing I like really pointed out there it does take a lot of time to do it. All right? It's not an easy job. You know, it cannot happen overnight. Because uh, it's just difficult to clear the weed. They, actually, they have to turn the soil a couple of times to make sure that the weeds had been totally uprooted. Or else they will return and take over the land again. Another problem is that uh, they, can, they, they could not use chemical because they would damage the soil. Another Third problem would be finding the right type of trees to be planted because they couldn't any plant any other trees. In fact, they had to plant something that could grow on this less fertile soil. Besides that, these trees should also be able to produce, uh, to be harvested for their timber. So two, two other trees that were tried and tested were teak tree and Senegal mahogany. They're good for making furniture. Well, with mixed success, all right. They really tried to plant some, but it didn't really work. Well, it's, it's a very difficult, challenging task, but the government kind of ran out of patience because it was pretty expensive to do so. Actually, it cost uh, every year about $4,000, and the forest, forest reserve themselves were not making any money. So what happened is they took back the lands and they passed it on to, of all places, the land office. Well, the land office did, in the end, Implement, uh, and introduced the Forest Reserve Ordinance all right, in 1908, but they didn't really care about it. All right. So what they did is they kind of uh, parcel out the reserves for various projects, including um, in Changi. All right, the Changi Reserve was carved out and what a, mit a military base was built. And parts of Bukitima was also, were also given to quarry miners all right, and the quarries that was taken from Bukit Timah was used to build the causeway, to build the Singapore Johor Railway, as well as the harbor. And if you think that's bad, well, in, uh, in, 19, in 1936, the land office kind of revoked it, all the reserves. Okay? They lost their status as forest reserve, except for Bukit Timah. So the body gardeners had to do something, so they stepped in and they, and they got it back. They got one, the, a smaller Bukitima reserve back, around 66, 66 hectares, as well as Kranji and Pandan. All right? Well, one thing to note at this point is that, okay, they were regazetted as a foreign reserve. And one thing, okay, and, but, uh, but they were still unable to, to prevent the quarry miners from en encroaching their land. Well, the, but then uh, in 1951, the Nature Reserve Act was implemented to kind of really reinforce their status as nature reserves. All right? And when that was implemented, Labrador, as well as uh, what, uh, the central catchment, was added 
were added as our nature reserves. Now, this is a map that shows where they are. So in 19, imagine in 1951, we have one, two, one, two, three, four reserves, right? But we lost one in Pandan. That's because it was, uh, it was, it, it was, it was, it lost its status is because it was, uh, it was used for the Jurong Industrial Estate, right? So today, yeah, we have all this Bukit Timah Reserve, Central Catchment, Labrador, and Sunai Bulu. That's a crunchy reserve. All right, with that, let's move on to tree planting. No, okay, tree planting. Okay, this activity is something that we associate very closely with our garden city vision, right? You always talk about tree planting. But one thing that I found out is that there was just so little written on its colonial history. It's pretty amazing. But if you look at the municipal records, all right, you know, and newspapers, what you can find is that this activity actually started around 1860s. You can actually find it. Why? Okay. You can see that roads like Stanford Road, River Valley Road, and Orchard Road were already planted with trees, and they were considered one of the finest at that time. And the agency that was in charge was the Municipal Engineers Department of the, of the, of the municip Municipality. But the records also show this very peculiar trend. Okay? When they plant these trees on these roads, they were actually, after some time, just, uh, just the tr when the trees was, was, uh, was about matured, they would actually cut it down or trim them to their bones. You know? And the public was pretty upset about it. All right? They write to the newspapers, they were complaining, they were saying, that, why would they do such thing? Why would they cut down, cut down all these trees? They were pro pro providing shade, making the whole place beautiful. Is it because it, the municipality had no idea what they are doing? They have no horticulture know-how or anything? Well, if you look at the muni municipal records, it actually shows their side of the story. The reason they cut down is pretty practical. That's because they need to free out space for infrastructure work. So what they did is that they cut down the trees in order to expand the road. They cut down the trees because they need to put utility poles, and that is for telephone lines and power cables. I will show to a picture with a utility line, a uh, utility, utility pole right in the middle. So they had no choice but to do it. The municipal records also review that they actually know what they are doing, okay? They know trees were supposed to beautify the place, to, supposed to beautify the place, and, okay, you're supposed to beautify the place as well as to provide shade. So, but then, uh, and also at, at, at that time, this practice was already widespread in the United States and Europe, so it's nothing new. All right? And they even have a nursery to prepare the saplings for, for tree planting. And, um, and in 1925, they actually launched a tree planting program with the Singapore Botanic, Bot Botanic Gardens. And some of the roads where trees were planted was uh, Jalan Basa, Scotts Road, Stevens Road, Bukit Timah, and Kappa Road, and New Bridge Road. Pretty surprising, right? You see all this picture? You can't read really on what I just said. Like Orchard Road, you have uh, roadside trees, Hill Street, all these places. Another stretch. So I say it's, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I find it pretty interesting. And by 1941, you have uh, more roads that were covered with uh, roadside trees, and Canberra Road would be interesting because. If you, if, if you can try to actually travel back time and look at that road at that time, they were actually Australian maple trees, and they were donated, they were given by the Australian government. So uh, roughly about 475 of them. And it was reported in the newspapers. But then when the Japanese came, they were under, under the Japanese, many of these roadside trees were cut down, were being cut down for their timber as well for fireworks. I mean firewoods, sorry. And in, but in 1948, the Municipal Commission launched a campaign to replant these trees. They actually planted about a thousand of them. And if you're interested, some of the species that were used was a rain tree. Colonial tree planting was not just confined to just the roadsides. In fact, the Singapore Improvement Trust actually planted trees in their estates to beautify the place. And in uh, 1952, February 1952, there's this beautification 
plan for Tiong Bahru. And over two years, they planted 500 trees. Right? And what is amazing is we look at the, this is from the minutes of the, uh, from SIT, okay, the minutes of the SIT. So they actually discuss how the trees should be planted. So there are specifications on how to do it, right? how it should be planted, you know, dig a hole and all these things. And the program was actually expanded to other SIT estates, including um, Kampong Silat, Bukit Mera, Wampo, and Raymond. These are roughly in the Queenstown area. And the bracketed numbers, they are the number of trees that were being planted back then. Also, SIT launched this uh, community tree planting program in June 1952. All right? And what I've shown up there is the estate manager's circular inviting the residents to plant trees in their estates. And the rationale was to, hey, you have to be involved in this activity just to beautify your estate. But the response was pretty bad. Out of uh, 250 tenants, only 15 responded. Yeah. So well, I guess uh, this idea of tree planting will remain a distant idea until the Garden City's vision was launched. So now let's move on to recreation spaces. Okay, the discussion for recreation spaces was actually linked to the debate of having open spaces. And that was raised, first raised in 1907 Sanitation Condition Report, as well as the 1918 Housing Commission. In these two reports, like for, the for example, 1907 report, open spaces were seen as backlinks. And these backlinks will open up these densely built residential areas. And it also ca they can also be used for scavenging, right? The 1918 Housing Commission report, open spaces were seen as breathing lungs. It's a very advanced thinking, right? Very modern thinking. As, as, as breathing lungs in the crowded, resident, uh, crowded built up area. And the people can actually use them for recreation activities. And this 1918 Housing Commission report stated that it was a, the agency that should be doing all creating all these recreation spaces should be the municipality themselves. But unfortunately, they were not doing anything, right? And they well, was actually condemned. They were actually condemned in the report. And they say that the only two places that were considered as a park was the Botanic Gardens and the People's Park. And I highlight the People's Park up there. And even Botanic Gardens was not even created by the municipality. But nonetheless, in 1928, they created the Parks and Open Spaces Committee, and that was to look into this matter. So what they did is, first thing they did is do it, they did a survey to find out what are the existing recreation spaces. And, now, and this is what they found. They actually stated, stated who were the users, and what you can see is that they kind of reinforced the, the Housing Commission report, because out of all this, only four were considered as public parks. And some, these are some photographs that I found in the archives. You know, these are the parks and the recreation, or open spaces back then, all right? And oh yeah, the rest of, the, of these recreation spaces were actually used by the sports associ associations, so it's not open to the public. I so we have Hongling Green and other spaces. There's more. So to address this, this problem, the committee went on to build at least 10 recreation spaces between 1930 and 1959, and it's shown up there. And it came in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And, you know, there are tennis, tennis courts, there were swimming pools, there were parks, there were playgrounds, there was even a stadium and an aquarium. If you look at the list up there, I would say that the well, what they did was pretty impressive, taking, taking into consideration the circumstances at that time, right? Like uh, what I've, I've highlighted, we had our first public swimming pool, that's in Mount Emily. At the pub, pub, first public sea swimming en enclosure, that's Katong, Katong Park Bathing Paga, right? I show the pictures down there. We have uh, King George Park, which contains Van Cleef, that is our first aquarium. And we have all sorts of things, more swimming pools. And everyone, yeah, I would say that they did a pretty good job. And this is a map. It shows the location of all these recreation spaces. I would say that you know, they try to make it as strategic as possible so that you know, the people can go and use, use all these uh, places. Unfortunately, there were actually a lot of problems. Okay? 
because these spaces were actually abused by the hawkers who were unregulated at the time. Also, it was poorly maintained, so the playing fields were muddy. And, well, it's pretty useless, you cannot use them. And it were, there were just not enough recreation spaces, okay? What I've shown up there are the hawkers. And down there will be a crowded park. In fact, overcrowd, uh, overcrowd, crowded, overcrowded parks uh, were usually, was usually a problem. It was highlighted in this, uh, this uh, Straits Times uh, um, report. And uh, yeah, I would say that it's not surprising because in the 1950s, Singapore actually experienced a population boom. So there yeah, were just not enough recreation spaces. And we move on. And these long pictures to show there's just a lack of greenery. And to fix that, we will move to the next part, the next question that's becoming a garden city. So what is this garden city vision? Everyone very familiar with it, right? You know, it's a change, transform Singapore from a concrete jungle into something that's covered with lush greenery, roadside trees, parks for oh, ample oh, green spaces for recreation activities. And there was also an economic angle to it. You know, I, I highlighted, highlighted, highlighted this uh, quote by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew when he launched this vision. There is uh, actually an economic perspective to it. And there was, if Singapore were to become a garden city with all these wonderful gardens and everything, it shows that Singapore was, is a well-organized city and that will attract tourists and investments. So, and how they implement this? It's through two stages, tree planting and building parks. All right, so look at tree planting. And how they do it is the objective of this tree planting phase is to create avenues of trees and abundance of lush greenery. And to do so, they have this dedicated agency. They set up this dedicated agency known as the Parks and Tree Unit within the Public Works Department in 1967. So this unit was responsible for all matters related to tree planting. And this included choosing the right types of trees. So again, they couldn't plant any other types of trees, any other trees, because uh, they had to choose the right type, uh, something that can thrive in the urban setting, something that can grow fast, something that can provide shade at the same time. You also think of ways of how to plant these trees in the build-up area, especially in the narrow streets. And the solution that I came up with is what I showed up there, creating a platform, a planting platform, and plant those trees. And it's something that we take it for granted. You can look outside, you know, we still see it today. And because there were other agencies like JTC, HDB, Housing Development Board, they were pursuing the same greening agenda in their own domain. They had to set up this whole of government uh, committee to, organ to coordinate the effort. And that was known as the Garden City Action Committee. It was formed in 1970. And to protect all these newly planted trees, they passed this, uh, this legislation known as the Parks and Trees Act. Okay, so this act actually look at the, look, uh, actually uh, what it did was to make it an offense for anyone who tried to damage the trees or remove the trees in public spaces. You also set regulations on how to maintain these trees, how to plant these trees, or how to conserve these trees. Yep. And also, they try to they bring in the community. They have the tree planting program, or the tree planting day. It was actually started in 1963, but then it became a national, a nationwide campaign in 1971. It was held annually. And shrub planting was also introduced to beautify uh, buildings, infrastructure. And she started in 1968, one year after the Garden City Division was uh, announced. And started off with government buildings, then one year later, in 1969, it was extended to infrastructure works. So hence, we have uh, all these shrubs all hanging around all our bridges. So if you're interested, some common trees we have, so green tree, angsana tree, and all this. Yep, and shrubs. All right. Well, so what I did is, uh, if you can see up there, I, I tried to count the number of trees that were planted uh, and try to plot it against some of the milestones when it comes to tree planting. You can see the spikes. Oh, oh yeah, if you're interested, actually in the annual reports of, of, uh, of uh, 
the Parks and Trees Unit, that is under the PWD, then followed by MND, and today MParks. So we do see little spikes, and these little spikes was because of, uh, of uh, certain milestones, like uh, for example, oh. So that's the launch of the Garden City Vision. Then followed by a spike here, that is because of the, of the passing of the first Trees and Plants Act. Then there was a launch of the tree, the tree Planting Day, and then it went down. I, I'm not sure why it went down, but anyway, after in 1975, when the second Trees and Plants Act were introduced, and when the Parks and Trees Unit was reconstituted as a department under MND, and the Potent Gardens were, were actually part of it as well, there was a huge spike, and it goes on. To the 1990s, over here we have Clean and Green Week, and then we have the Green Blue, Blue Plan. I will talk about this Green Blue Plan later, and then it went down here. I think uh, it's because maybe the population of, of our tree has reached 1.4 million, so I guess uh, they stopped counting. In fact, after that, I couldn't find any numbers until I think last year, and I look at the MPARC's uh, annual report, I found that they plant like 30,000 trees. And if, if you look at that, 30,000 trees, right? If you look at that, that benchmark, if you draw a line across, you can see that most of the years, Singapore was planting around, 20, around from 20,000 trees, at least 20,000 trees, all the way to about maybe average 30,000, 40,000. So pretty impressive, because if you think about during the colonial period, they were planting about 1,000 trees, and they were like so happy about it. But uh, after the Gun City Division was launched, we have that. Same as shrubs. Well, I count the number of shrubs as well, and again, you can get it from the annual report. And you do see spikes. I'm not going to go all the way back there, but I can tell you that some of the spikes uh, happened is because of, like over here, there was big spikes, and that's because uh, during that time, uh, the government started building a lot of parks, and they were expanding the expressways. So perhaps that explains why there were spikes there. Sorry, I, I, I won't be covering this. All right, building parks, that's the second phase of a Garden City Vision. Now it's carried on in two stages, the pre-1975, post-independence, pre-1975 stage, as well as the post-1975. Now the development of this park lands uh, in the pre-1975 stage was mostly in the form of upgrading, mostly in the form of upgrading existing ones. So public amenities and facilities like park shelters, restroom, benches, walkways, uh, car parks, cycling tracks were built. Uh, and uh, train and shrubs were also planted to make it nicer. And, but, but during this period, at least seven new parks were built, and some of these were here. We have uh, Mount Faber Park, Central Park, that's Fort Canning, Topayo Park, and East Coast Park. East Coast Park is the best, all right? It's actually our largest, uh, our largest park even today. It's 185 hectares, and uh, it's built, and built on uh, reclaimed land. And he said it has a seven kilometers beach and a man-made lagoon. And today we have barbecue pit, chalets, and everything, and a jetty for fishing. The next stage, the post-1975 stage, and this one, it happened is because uh, of the release of the revised master plan. Now, this master plan kind of, uh, yeah, there's a quote up there. This master plan kind of identified that, uh, that we should start building more parks because of the changing, changing uh, demand of uh, a more, fluent, I mean, because Singapore was becoming, the people was becoming more affluent. So they have this uh, higher demand for recreation activities. And hence, they should build more parks. And the newer parks that were built at that time were very different from the existing ones. And you see, they were bigger. All right? They were equipped with a wide range of facilities to make a different kind of recreation needs of different population groups. And um, they were also aesthetically designed to give its own identity and character and it kind of changed our, our landscape, right? So we were losing our forests at the very beginning, right? Now we are getting them back. Well, not really forests, but, forest, for, but uh, if, if, well, we are talking about vegetation cover, right? So, 
Anyway, the number of parks actually grew from about 20 to four, more than 400 from 1975 to 2015. And the total land size uh, of all these parks in 2015 is about 8% today. So towards the end of the 1980s, the government started to think how to, how to um, advance or how to heighten this uh, Garden City impression, this vision. And the way they do it is they introduced this green-blue plan. This is part of the 1991 concept plan. And the idea was to turn Singapore into a huge playground. All right? And one way to do it is to introduce green corridors where you connect all the parks together. The parks, nature sites, uh, and everything connect together, connect them together so that they can, uh, the users can travel from one, one park to, to, to another. And that's what we know today as the park, our park connectors. And uh, after, since it was introduced in 1990, it has grown to 300 kilometers. So pretty impressive. So this is a map of our park connector, if you are interested. And these are some of the parks that were built after 1975. All right. So if you put all this together, trees, the, tree, the roadside trees, the parks, the nature reserves, the vegetation, our vegetation cover actually increased very, significant, very significantly from 36% to 47% from 1966 to 2007. And uh, so today, well, the government has advanced, right? Because Garden City, Garden City vision had already been achieved. So they have to introduce another, another spin it off to another thing. So it's, now it's called the city in the garden. So what was it? It was to integrate greenery into uh, the built environment, the buildings, and to our daily lives. And some of the directions were spelled in the parks and water bodies plan that was introduced in, in the master plan, 202 master, master plan. So how are, gonna, how are they going to achieve this, right? Yeah, they were looking at things like community, community gardening or community in bloom or vertical greening. So you have uh, plantings on buildings. And of course, we have our gardens by the bay. And this Jurong Lake Gardens, this is a new garden. It's coming up uh, in, in the future. And this is, uh, I see it as a reinterpretation of our ex existing garden. So we actually envision it to be a people's garden. So the land spaces and will be landscape and created for families, for community to come, come together. And there are also, also a space where the community can come and get up close and personal with uh, our native plants, our native uh, natural heritage. And there's a place to hold concerts and stuff, something like the Botanic Gardens today. If you are interested, this is a Parks and Water, water, water Bodies plan. If you want to get an like, official map of our gardens, of our park connectors, or all these small gardens and communal gardens, everything, you can use this map. It's from one map, URA one map. And these are my references. So. With that, I've come to the end of my presentation. And just Gambia. now you mentioned uh, Gambia, Gambia and pepper plantations. Yeah. Okay, Gambia was, uh, is, uh, it was used for well, it's used for dyeing. They actually dye clothes with it. Color dyes, yeah. It? So oh. something like that. So back then, why why there was a proliferation of uh, Gambia plantations mm. because uh, the industry, the dyeing, ten, oh sorry, tanning industry was uh, taking off, and they need Gambia to dye the clothes. Natalie Kenley report has mm. uh, get, uh, proposed a number of sites as forest reserves. Um, just because I've never seen the map before, but um, how many of those proposed sites actually become uh, forest reserves in early 90s? Yeah, actually, all, what, all get. what I show up there, the 14 nature reserves, they were the nature reserves. All right? But it was, it was not gazetted as nature reserves until 1908. That's where the Nature for Forest Reserve Ordinance was introduced. So these are the 14 sites. Actually, there's one site called Military, all right? But then uh, it was used as a nursery. And eventually, it was, uh, by 1900s, it was not there. All right, it was removed. Because, yeah. I wanted to ask, how does your, uh, the collection at the library related to uh, gardens in Singapore um, connect to also what's happening with the development of green spaces 
uh, in Singapore as well. So um, by that I mean what practices are currently happening to boost the collection of materials about garden spaces in Singapore to parallel the movement of green spaces being developed as well. Okay, um, we don't have a dedicated uh, collection on greenery, on green spaces or anything on the environment. But what I can tell you is that how I got this data, okay, be, okay we have books that were being published, including Timothy Bernard's latest book. It's a very good book. If you want to go into the primary sources, you have to go to the different agencies. So you have to find out what are the agencies. Like if you want to find colonial planting, you have to know, uh, you, have, you have to find the municipal records, all right? So municipal commission minutes, as well as another, another set of minutes, all right? That one was kept in the archives. All right, those are the raw minutes. So everything was handwritten. So those, so the way to build this, to understand this collection is to go into the different agencies, and from there you have to trace your, trace your, all, to all these different parts of greening. Uh, even for Nathaniel Kenley's uh, uh, report, that one, well, you can look at the Botanic Gardens uh, annual report. That's another greening agency, right? If you want to see it that way, and from there you have to understand hey, why do they, why did he do it, you know? Who, who commissioned it? And the government actually commissioned it. Hence, you have to look at the legislative council proceedings. And because back then, all these reports were published in there. There was no separate like white paper and all these things. Mm -hmm.